Hi, everyone. Welcome. I love seeing the little boxes all popping up. Hi, Ken. I saw you're waving to us. Ken is one of our regulars. He loves this program. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm going to just let everyone get their audio and their video um, sorted. Um, but before we start, just a couple of housekeeping things. So I'm Rebecca. I'm with PMD Alliance. I'm our manager of digital programs. And with us today, um, as we've had for like the past three months, although it feels like even longer, um, we have Dr. Subramanian with us who, as I've told you all um, before, Dr. Subramanian has been volunteering so much of her time to be on these programs and bringing these amazing speakers. And we are so, so lucky to have her. Um, and then also we have uh, Judy Long with us and I'll let Dr. Subramanian uh, introduce her in one second. Um, but just as a reminder, we do take all questions in the chat. So if you want to even just post in there where you're tuning in from, that would be awesome. Just love to hear where you're from and just get used to using the chat function if you haven't used it before. Um, this program is being recorded, so it will be available afterwards um, on our YouTube channel and on our website. So um, without further ado, uh, Dr. Supermanian, why don't you take it away? Okay, well, thank you. Welcome everyone um, to our uh, physically distanced, socially connecting universe here. Um, it's with great pleasure that I introduce uh, Judy Long, who's um, a colleague and a friend uh, from San Francisco. Um, I've met Judy over the years in um, various initiatives through some of the gang that you've already met on the series, including um, Maya Katz, who she works closely with, and Benzi Kluger, um, who's now in Rochester, New York, and um, really through these sort of neuro palliative care initiatives. And so we'll dive a little bit into that. But I wanted to invite Judy because she has just this rich background, um, both from a spiritual perspective, and hopefully we'll learn a, a little bit about her journey there. And also um, just as a provider on the, the palliative care team in San Francisco, um, she's been an instrumental as her role as a chaplain. And I think there's been a lot of myths and confusion about what a chaplain is, if you have to be religious, do you have to pray in order to want to talk to a chaplain? And so we're hoping to dispel some of those myths and have people understand a little bit more about, um, you know, her uh, role as a chaplain on that team and what what role she fills there, and also um, how you might fill these own these sorts of roles in your own communities with the resources that you have. Um, she's also been working very closely with some caregiver initiatives, and we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but first, maybe, Judy, since you're a teacher of meditation, um, maybe I'll just let you bring us all here first before we get into some of this, um, but maybe like a grounding meditation, if I could indulge us, and then, and then we can talk a little bit more about these various subjects. My pleasure, but before I even start, let me just say hello, everyone. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you from the heart for inviting me. I'm really happy to join you for this today. So the grounding meditation, I'm so glad that we're starting with that because when I'm teaching, interestingly, in a class or even when I'm working with people one-on-one, -on -one, I often will start with that because it's a way to settle our minds and our bodies. So this is a very simple exercise. Any one of you can not only do it now, but do it whenever you wish, whenever you feel the slightest bit stressed. So if you would for a moment, just get yourselves as comfortable as you can in your chair and Perhaps if your legs are crossed, if it's comfortable for you to do this, maybe put your feet on the ground. And I would say wiggle around a little on your chair so you feel like you're somewhat evenly distributed between your two sit bones. And allow your spine to sway a little bit left to right, maybe front to back, just to find sort of a comfortable central place. We don't, we don't need to have a stiff or straight back, but a relaxed alert one can be quite nice. Same with the head and the neck. Maybe let your chin go left to right a little bit, front to back, till you feel sort of a comfortable resting place in the middle. And I always start there. You don't have to do all that, but I feel like it's a helpful way to settle the body. So on the next in-breath, if you're comfortable noticing the breath, and if not, I'm going to ask you to put your attention to somewhere neutral in your body, um, like perhaps hold one hand in the other and squeeze it so you can feel it. But if not that, then if the breath is okay, on the next in-breath, I'd like you to notice 
the physical sensation of the air entering your nostrils. So go ahead and breathe in. All right. So again, I'm going to ask you to do it again. What I want you to notice is any physical feeling you could feel while the air was entering your nostrils. So go ahead and breathe in. Okay. And during the out breath, just let the out breath take care of itself, but I'm going to ask you to shift your attention, drop your attention into your body. See if you can notice the physical sensation of the bottom of the chair supporting your sit bones. And let your attention be sustained there for a second or two. I know it's not what we usually do, so I'm going to ask you to do it again. So notice the sensation of the support of the chair. You may feel like a slight pressure upwards toward your, your bottom. Just notice that. And finally, I'm going to ask you to put the two pieces together. So I'll ask you, I'll tell you first, and then I'll ask you to do it. So what I, I'm going to ask you to do is to do the breath in. Notice on the in-breath the sensation of the air entering your nostrils. And then during the out-breath, breath, don't worry about the breath. Drop your attention into your body. Notice the sensation of the support of the chair. So here we go. Next in-breath, breathe in. Notice the sensation of the air entering your nostrils. And during the out-breath, don't worry about the breath. Just drop your attention into your body. Notice the sensation of the support of the chair. And when you're ready, if your eyes happen to be closed, you could open them now, that's fine. And that's a, a very quick, simple grounding technique. If you were standing up, you could use the sensation of the support of the floor beneath your feet. But it looks like most everyone's sitting, so I use the support of the chair. And if you wonder, where did that come from? Why did she ask me to do that? I'll let you know where I learned it. I learned this from some people that were training me in teaching trauma resilience. These were people that went all around the world where there were things like fires and earthquakes and tidal waves. And they would teach some of these grounding techniques to people right on the ground. And maybe they, the people that were doing the teaching were in there even before the Red Cross could get to them. And it was a way to help people learn to ground themselves when something had happened that was very stressful. At first they were doing it for extreme trauma. And then they found this is great for stress, distress or trauma. So it's a wonderful technique no one can tell you're doing it. You could do this anytime. And um, I offer it to you if, you, if you think that's even slightly useful, I would suggest try it out when you're not stressed so that it becomes familiar and you kind of know what it was you did. And then when you need to use it, it will already be familiar to you. So I know we could talk about this a lot more. I'm going to step back from that, but thank you so much for giving me the chance to share that with you. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's a really nice way to arrive and just sort of take a few moments to be together here. Um, you know, we're all distanced in this kind of artificial way, but I think it brings us together to know that we're all doing this mm -hmm. possibly all over the world together for, for a few moments. So that, that's great. And we'll maybe get back to some of that uh, meditation, um, you know, different sort of type uh, perhaps later in this. Um, so I look forward to that as well, but thank you. So Judy, tell us a little bit about how you became, maybe your journey to where you are, and then maybe you can define a little bit about um, what a chaplain is um, and, sure, and sort of what your role is right now, but how you kind of meandered through life and ended up in this, because I think it's kind of an interesting story. Thank you for saying meander. So I'm going to try not to meander too much in telling this, but I will say I was not expecting to become a chaplain. That was not what I thought I was going to do. But when I've thought about that, you know, I do get asked that question sometimes. And I've thought back, why did I do this? How come I'm doing this? And when I thought about it, I thought, well, actually, I grew up with it. Who would have known? So when I was a child, my father died when I was quite young. I was about 13. And my mom had to find a job and she got a job in the local hospital and they asked her if she would be a liaison between the hospital administration and the patients and the families and she loved doing it so that's what she did and they liked her and they said we love what you're doing and you can work in any part of the hospital you want what would you like to do my mom's name was eve eva she was saying she they said eva what what would you like to do and she said oh i want to work with the people who are terminally ill now 
I, it never occurred to me to ask her why she said that. I was 13 years old. Who asks your mommy why you're doing what you're doing? Just what she did. Maybe it's because my father died when I was quite young. Maybe it's because my mom had been a lifelong caregiver growing up herself. I don't know why, but that's what she did. So for me growing up, as I was a teenager, a young teen, that was just normal. That's what people did. I thought everyone worked with people that were at end of life. So I think that's probably what really pointed me in this direction, even though I may have done lots of other things in between then and now. And um, um, without going into too much detail, I will say at one point, maybe about 15, 10 or 15 years ago, um, I was at a, a kind of a crossroads where I'd stopped doing the kind of work I was doing. I was thinking, oh, what do I want to do? Maybe I want to go back to school. Maybe I'll go back and do art because I always like that. Or maybe I'll do marine biology because I always like that. And then I went to a little workshop for a weekend. And I thought, oh, I think I'd like to do a weekend workshop in meditation because I used to do that and I want to do more of it. It'll remind me how. So I went there and it turned out the person teaching it had started a program that has become internationally well-known. Some of you may have even done it. It's called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. And it's just a way of um, meeting difficult circumstances in a way that allows us to navigate that territory a little more easily. And I thought, oh, this is so cool. That's what I want to learn to do. So when I started learning to do it, I was told I had to um, go on meditation retreats before I learned how. And when I was doing that, I found a place that had meditation retreats, but they also offered a program in Buddhist chaplaincy. And I thought, well, that's interesting, but that's not what I want to do. But I read about it and I, I thought, well, it's still not what I want to do, but I'm, I'm still curious. I kept reading that same thing over and over. And finally I thought, actually, that's what I want to do. So I went back and started going through that introductory program. And then from there, I went to a large general county hospital in San Francisco and did field work there and loved it. And it sort of, I felt like my decision was made at that point. And then I went back for more training and chaplaincy. So that's how that happened. So that's amazing, really amazing. So tell us about, I don't know if there's a specific definition for a chaplain, but maybe you could tell mm -hmm. us about that and your role on the team and who else is on the team. Yeah, so I, I would just broadly mention chaplain. What I'd like to do is kind of narrow in on palliative care chaplain, because that's the kind of chaplaincy I practice. So, um, and I'm guessing that you've already spoken. I'm asking Dr. Subramanian that you've spoken a great deal already about what is palliative care, yes? But maybe you can define that from your perspective. I, I always <laughs> like to learn from other people. So, okay. so I'll, I'll come back to that, but I'll say first, my, my role now is as a palliative care chaplain, and I work with... Um, in a particular clinic that's in neuropalliative care, primarily for patients and their families where the patients are living with advanced Parkinson's or the atypical Parkinsonisms. Sometimes we also have a supplement to that grant for people that have um, uh, Alzheimer's as well. So that's what's in my clinic there. I also work with a clinic with advanced cancers. So those are the two areas I work with the most. And chaplaincy in general, um, is defined as spiritual care. And what does that mean? You know, it's surprising when I was working in the hospital with many people of all faiths, right? Very few talked with me about religion. Certainly there were some. Certainly there were some for whom that was really what sustained them. But the majority would say, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. Or I'm an atheist, or I'm agnostic. People said all kinds of things, and they were for all from all different faith traditions. So a hospital chaplain is really trained to work with everybody, no matter what, and to offer spiritual care. And what does that mean? So it's not looking at someone's symptoms, you all know that, although the symptoms may affect how someone feels spiritually. Um, but I look at it as, as, from my perspective, what I'm looking for and what I try to strengthen. Excuse me, I'm gonna clear my throat and come back. Give me a second. So I feel like it's my role as a team member to understand as best I can what's going on for the person I'm meeting with in terms of what, what strengthens them, what nurtures them in a spiritual way. You think, what's spiritual mean? If we're not talking about religion, or even if, even if we are, what does that really consist of? And what I've learned over time is that it, 
consists of a few different areas. One may be, um, do I feel as though I have some sort of purpose in my life, something that's really deeply important to me? Maybe I, maybe, and maybe that's been a changing thing over my life, but do I know what really matters to me? And people have different answers for that. Or do I feel a bit at sea right now? because of being faced with a serious illness, where the only thing I can realize right now is, why is this even happening? This isn't right. So that whole idea of meaning and purpose, and purpose that's greater than self, is one area of spirituality that, that I look to try to understand a little bit with someone. How is, what is that like for you? And how are you with that? I don't usually ask it in quite that out right away, but I'll ask them what, what strengthen someone? What do they turn to when things are difficult? And we'll start talking about that together. A second area of um, spiritual, the spiritual domain, I would say, or spiritual strength is the broad umbrella of connection versus isolation. And, and again, it's been my experience with serious illness that even people who are normally enormously engaged with others can often take a step back and begin to isolate themselves. Um, sometimes people are aware of that, sometimes they're not. But I will say that I know that connection strengthens us. We're even built to connect. So it doesn't mean we have to be with people 24 seven, but it does advise us, if you will, to notice what am I doing with this and what would make sense to do, whether I'm the person with a serious illness or whether I'm a caregiver. What does that look like for me? So that's a huge area and it has lots of sub areas under it. So I won't go into all of them now, but I'd say that is the large second area I look at. And the third one is going to sound very counterintuitive perhaps, but I find it super important. And it's this whole area of choice in contrast to helplessness, right? So I'm the first one to know and say, no, I don't have a choice about having this illness. If I could get rid of it, I wouldn't have it. And this wouldn't even be a conversation we're having. So I'm not talking about that choice. But given that there are some things I cannot change, what are the choices I can make that are going to help me be with the people I love, help me be with myself in the midst of going through this and live my life in a way that feels more whole? than it would otherwise. So all of those are areas, I think of them as areas of spiritual resilience, really. A lot of times people know just what they are. It's just that when we're slammed with a difficult diagnosis, a lot of times we forget them. So my job often is just helping people remember, what is it that you turn to that strengthens you in these areas? And what do you wanna do? And sometimes it's like, I don't know, you know, I'm just feeling upset right now. And sometimes that's okay. You just need time. Or maybe there is time needed to think about it, have the conversation, or even learn some skills that are helpful in any one of those domains. So it's kind of a long answer to a short question, but I, I wanted to at least propose those components of what I look at when I'm being with people. Um, there are, you may wonder why, why am I not talking about things like grief and loss, but actually I, I do consider those parts of how we connect with others and with ourselves. So I typically address that within that realm. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't wanna go on and on. Uh, so no, I mean, that's all beautiful. So it sounds like there's sort of three main areas. You were saying purpose, social connection, and then um, the third choice. one. Choice. Choice. And the choice to affect sort of change where you have, you know, um, you, you, the choices that you have to, the ability to choose around, I guess, um, in your own sort of um, uh, world. And, and, and so when you have these interviews with people, because um, I know you care a lot about caregivers as well, um, do you have individual interviews with um, perhaps the person with Parkinson's and then their caregivers separately? Or how are you able to connect these dots? It's a question that we asked ourselves in our clinic when we were seeing people either in person or online. It's a good question. Um, where we are right now, and this change is this a moving target, because I don't know that there's one right answer. 
I find that I, it's really helpful to me and I think to the rest of the team, if the entire team can meet with the patient and their family at once, even if it's not for the longest part of the visit, just so we can see who, who we're talking about. So that when Dr. Katz is in the room telling someone about the chaplain, they're not, people aren't saying, I don't know who you're talking about. I haven't met that person. Who is that? I don't know if I want to meet a chaplain. So it's nice if they can see me initially and go, oh, well, she, she looks like she's not too dangerous. Maybe I'll talk with her. But, but I like that for that reason as an initial introduction. I also find that some of the initial conversations that are occurring perhaps between Dr. Katz and the patient and family, there are things where I'm sitting there and I'm going, oh, that, that points me to a question I want to ask when I meet with them later. So I like the idea of having a sort of hybrid model where we have a bit of both. And then you asked if I meet with patient and caregiver together. Sometimes it depends on what they'd like, but a lot of times it's useful to then have separate opportunities to talk individually because sometimes the patient might want to talk with me about things that they may not wish to say around the caregiver and same for the caregiver. So it's, it's, um, you know, we try to be as respectful around that. I don't want to force that anything on someone, but on the other hand, I want to make sure that we provide space for people to talk about what's concerning them. So I think that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, could you tell us a little bit about um, who the team members are? Because I know you guys were involved in one of these projects with the PCORI grant, looking at giving palliative care um, as a team approach um, with certain providers skilled in that versus um, care that would be more standardized. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about who's on the team that's also providing care in, in San Francisco. Sure, and I, I would ask all of you to, to just imagine that you're meeting with someone by Zoom like this. And instead of seeing my head, you're seeing like five people in the room at one time. <laughs> that's often what it'll be like for that initial introduction. So there would be the physician, the neurologist, and that would be you, those of you that were here last time, you, you might have met Dr. Katz. And then there is a nurse practitioner or a nurse. Mm -hmm. There is also a social worker, which I find to be enormously helpful. There's so many times, I'm gonna just do a little, what do you call it, bird walk? I'm gonna go off topic for a second just to say, there's so many times I'm speaking with someone and they'll ask me something and I'll say, that's such a great question and I really wanna connect you with our social worker because the social workers know things that the rest of us are not expert in. It's great to have a social worker on the team. And then we also have a palliative care specialist. So this is also a physician who specializes in palliative care. And they are expert at not only symptom management, but they're also expert at um, talking about how to make the goals of our care in agreement with or concordant with what our wishes are. So like, what do we care about? What are our wishes? What do we want? So great to talk about those things early on when we're feeling clear-minded and well enough to talk about them. It's not something you wanna have the conversation about when you feel so sick, you can't even think straight, right? So it's great to have a palliative care specialist on the team. And then we can call in others. I was on a, a team, a different team, when I worked in um, pulmonary care. And one of the members of our team then was a pharmacist. It would never have occurred to me. And it was so great to have a pharmacist with us. And sometimes we were doing home visits and people had a box this big. And all of you people know this, what it's like to have a lot of medicines. But they'd have a whole box full of inhalers plus their medicines. And, and the pharmacist would walk in, they just put their arms, this woman, she was great. She'd wrap her arms around the box and take it aside and start pulling all these things out and looking at them and figuring out what's helpful and what's not. It was great. And, and we have access to a pharmacist, should we want one, you know, to help us out with that, any of the decisions we have. We're psychologists. So I'll stop. There. But the routine members of the team are the ones I told you about. Yep. And usually when we walk in the room, the nurse has already spoken with the family prior to that. So she usually doesn't walk in the room for that initial visit. So it's one less person, helps a little bit. So when, I, I wanted to get a sense because you have the experience of being, um, you know, knowing about palliative care as it's practiced in other specialties and then knowing a lot now about um, the Parkinson's patients and their caregivers. Mm -hmm. And historically there was a sense that as neurologists, we didn't really need to care that much about palliative care. That was somebody else's job. We could either have the primary care do it or refer to a palliative care doctor. But I think there's been an increasing push and you're part of this um, 
new society that's just developing um, called the International Neuro Neuropalliative Care Society. And um, I wanted you to be able to speak a little bit about maybe define palliative care, maybe talk about, you know, how you think the needs are of patients with Parkinson's in the palliative care realm compared to maybe some of the cancer patients, maybe if you feel that they, they are equivalent, more, less, and then maybe talk a little bit more about why you think that the neuropalliative care um, specialty may be useful as a society and perhaps how you think that patients can get involved in this type of initiative. Yeah. Such good questions. They're big questions too. So you asked me first to talk about palliative care and, and there's so many ways of defining it and describing it. But when I look at a very simple way of describing it, I would say extra layer of support. It doesn't mean that your existing docs are going to go away. You're going to keep all the same supports you still have, and you have this extra layer of support, of people that can directly address some of these issues around, around quality of life. So the purpose of the palliative care team is to make sure that you get the very best quality of life that's possible. So you can live your life as well as you can for as long as you can. And that's what palliative care is all about. And I just love that. I actually had a, a, a caregiver in a, an online caregivers course that I teach from Texas. I'm in San Francisco. And she said, we've been going for years with all these different docs. Is it possible? And she looked me up online and she found our doctor, Dr. Katz and palliative care team online. She said, is it possible from Texas for us to see your palliative care team? Because I think maybe that would help. So it's this extra layer of support. I'll keep it very simple and keep it there. And I'm going to forget all the, the questions, but I think you were talking about neuropalliative particularly. And I had an anecdote that I, or a story call, you will, that I wanted to share that, that has to do with the launch. I love this word, the launch. I didn't know they said that about studies of the study for neuropalliative care that I've been honored to be a part of. But basically it's through the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And I hope you heard the first word, patient. That meant that this study involved patients and even designing the study. So when I got together with a bunch of people to talk about how are we going to start this thing out? How's the study going to work? There were patients present as well, not just clinicians. And they had a very strong voice in the design pro uh, process, but they also, I can still remember this. It was so compelling. Patients and caregivers together wanted an opportunity to speak to this large assembly of clinicians to say, we want you to hear this loud and clear. We have had Parkinson's for X number of years and it varied, but most of them were, had had it for at least 10 years. They said, we should have had palliative care from the day of diagnosis. From the day of diagnosis. And they repeated that and they made such a compelling case for it because they talked about what happened when somebody gave me this diagnosis and said, come back in six months. Or they said, it's not as bad as some things come back in six months. And of course, like any of us, we're going to go home and look up Dr. Google. What does that mean? Who knows what we're going to find? We'll scare ourselves half to death. But we wouldn't learn the things that might be most useful for us to know. And they said, if someone had just reached out or, or provided more holistic care, so not just the physician talking to the patient, but a team of people saying, in your life, it may mean this. What's that going to mean to you on all these different levels of what you need to think about? And then to have not just the patient involved, but the family or the close friends, the people that are involved. So that, that to me was probably my biggest, um, the thing that moved me most into thinking neuropalliative care is essential. But I will say that um, I've also worked with different neurological illnesses other than Parkinson's. And I see this need throughout. I think it's across the board. And palliative care in the past has not routinely been a part of neurology, just hasn't been. And so frequently people are exquisitely trained as neurologists and they just don't know what palliative care even is. So it doesn't, it's not that they're bad people, they're great people, they're wonderful physicians, but they don't, they're not familiar with it. So I'm, I'm very excited about the society that you're mentioning and that because I think it's a chance for people to start going, oh my gosh, you know, this could be helpful to our patients. This is a way of doing this. So um, I, I'm not sure I answered all your questions. So please yeah. let me yeah, know. Maybe I'll just get, come back to one or two of them. Since you, you also work with cancer patients, 
Oh, yeah. And you're working with Parkinson's patients, like in two separate clinics. Um, can you maybe contrast the needs? I mean, I, I think that there was a sense that our patients with Parkinson's don't have as high a need from a palliative care perspective, oh. cancer patients. But I've also read studies where they've, they've measured the needs and the distress, the caregiver distress and things of Parkinson's patients. And they are as high, if not higher in some cases, um, as you know, patients with pretty sick, you know, um, devastating cancers, right? So. Thank you for asking the question because to be quite honest, I'm so accustomed to how desperately in my view, profoundly, perhaps is a better word, palliative care is needed in neuro, in, Neurology, neuro, neuro palliative care, I would say. I don't even think of that question. It doesn't even occur to me. Um, I would say the palliative care needs of cancer patients and the palliative care needs of neurology patients are where they might be, they might be similar if it's someone that has brain tumors, right? Or they might be very different. But I would say the level of need is at least as great, um, if not greater because frequently um, a neurological illness can last for years. So someone is trying to figure things out across a period of time that might be 25 years long or seven. Well, frequently, this is sometimes true of cancer patients, but usually their journeys are shorter in terms of the time. They might be very quick. They might be seven, 10 years long, don't know. but. Um, I believe that um, the impairment that occurs over time is, is just very difficult for both the caregiver and the patient. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it is. I think we have uh, in medicine probably done a little bit of a disservice in some of these terms. When we talk about palliative care, people really do think of end of life. We probably are not open our minds to thinking about it in some specialties. I think neurology training is sadly lacking and even a, a basic understanding of some of these principles. And, um, you know, I think that also in medicine, we've done a, a real disservice in defining words like the word chaplain, because I think people mm -hmm. think about these words and when we offer them, they, they already, you know, have a, a picture of, of a priest who's coming around to say some, you know, very classic Bible prayers or something, or, a, or a, you know, um, some, some very, very standard, um, image comes to their mind and and then they they feel like if we ask them if they want to meet the chaplain that, that we're asking them to get their last rites, you know, or something like that. And, you know, it, I think really we're, we're not meeting patients and their needs in the right way because of some of even the definitions or how we've defined these in, in our own heads, um, even in the medical community. So I, I think we need to do some re-education. I think through the society, we'll be able to help um, empower each other to learn more and, and get patients involved like these grassroots efforts, as you were talking about, where people are coming to, to um, these uh, study designers and coming up with ways to push the field forward and really get um, what they need. So I think that, that the hope is to connect many dots with that society. So we urge you guys um, out there and the PMD Alliance is hoping to bridge this as well to, to get involved. And we're just founding this society and we'll, we'll have a lot of um, room for patient and patient advocacy. So we hope that you'll stay involved. Now, Judy, you've been doing some amazing work with the um, caregiver um, support, and I wanted you to be able to speak about that and maybe um, teach people about how it's evolved. Um, there's just been a lot of comments here about how um, people wish you were near them, that they live near you at UCSF, um, you know, that they had access to you and your, your um, teachings, you know, even outside of just the state of California. Um, and, and so I think that people are, are hungry to learn more about this, but maybe you could teach us a little bit about what you're doing from a caregiver support right now um, with some of your classes and your programs. And then also we can link some resources that you can provide us as well so that everybody, you know, even if they can't, um, you know, have access directly to you can have access to things that may help them in their own lives. So. Uh, thank you. That's uh, another big question. I like the big questions. Um, I will, I'd like to share with you something uh, that I've been doing um, and I'm trying to think how to make it, how to narrow it down to just make it brief. So about four or five years ago, I started teaching a class online. So this was pre-COVID, right? I was using Zoom because so many caregivers couldn't come to a class, right? They needed to be at home and a lot of them were very spread out. Plus we were seeing... Um, our, the study I was on was in California, Colorado, and Wyoming. 
So people were spread out. I thought, well, how can I teach a class for caregivers? And I thought, Zoom, that'll work. So I taught a class on Zoom. And um, actually, the first time I taught it, I taught it for a, a foundation that sponsored it. And there, were, there was somebody who was a caregiver in England and a caregiver in um, Jersey. So they were from all over the place, somebody from Canada. What happens in these courses? Good question. So, you know, I spoke about those three areas that I look for when I'm looking for spiritual resilience. Um, I think of those as just being human resilience. That, you know, what is it that we need to strengthen that's going to bring us some resilience in the middle of being present with difficult situations? So this particular course was geared to caregivers. I also have taught it for people that are also living with Parkinson's, uh, although not as frequently. And when I taught it for people living with Parkinson's, um, I think I made it slightly shorter in length because it's a long time to sit still in one place and people had to perhaps get their meds or get their, um, have breaks more frequently. So long story short, if it was for caregivers, it was an eight session class once a week. And it covered the things that we've been talking about in here. So I usually would start by teaching some grounding practices, and then I would go to the whole idea of meaning and purpose, and how can we recall our intention? How do we do that in a way that we don't have to think about it all day and just bring it into our awareness so it strengthens us? And then there were several classes devoted to the idea of connection, and within those categories, I would talk about stress and distress. And how can we notice when we're feeling stressed and do something that helps us meet difficult emotions? So there's a whole session on that. Um, had a session on self-compassion, what an idea. And then for caregivers, we had a session on um, the dynamic that occurs when someone is not comfortable about how much, when, when the person that's living with the illness is having difficulty with not wanting to be a burden and yet they still need to connect. And what is that like for both the caregiver and the person living with the illness? We also had a class devoted to the whole subject of loss and grief and what is that about? And how can we work with it in a way that's, um, that helps us. You know, it's not just wallowing around and feeling sadness, but understanding what's going on in a way that helps us find some strength in the middle of what's happening. And then going to this whole idea of choices. And so in choices, in each one of these classes, I teach some skills. And just like the grounding one you learned in the beginning. They're not long skills. They're things that any one of us could do. And the idea is, can you learn this skill and take it with you? Try it out for a week. Come back next week and say, how'd it go? You know, did you like it? Did you not like it? Was it useful to you? And we all learn from each other, right? It's not just me talking. So a class, I might show you how to do something. I may tell you why I'm showing it to you, why I think it's important, maybe why it's helped me. And I give people in my class a chance to be in pairs with each other, right? You don't want to just listen to me talking at you, right? So it's nice if you could talk to one of the other people in the group so there's a way with Zoom that you can have breakout rooms. I don't know if you know that or not, but like I can push a button and put everybody in pairs. And then I wouldn't hear you. You just hear your partner. You could talk with your partner about how you like that exercise you just tried out. What was that like? And you could get acquainted a little bit if you wanted. So there's always time for that in every class. And there's a chance to practice. I think I had to practice before. And then there's a chance to talk about what do we want to do before next week and practice. So that's what an average class would look like. Oh, I always have um, a five minute bio break in the middle because I need it. I hear everybody else, even if you don't need it, you maybe you need a break to stand up and sit down or to get a fresh cup of tea. I don't know, but I just give it to people anyway because I think all of us needs to have that. And um, I think when I did the class for people living with Parkinson's, I'm, instead of, oh, the classes were an hour and a half long and it was once a week. And the five minute bio break was somewhere in the middle. When I taught the class for people that were living with Parkinson's, I made it an hour long instead of an hour and a half. Still had a bio break. And um, I think I probably kept the number of faces on the screen a, a bit fewer. I had like, I'd have fewer people in the class. My normal class might've been 20, but when I had the people living with Parkinson's, I might've made it six or seven. Cause I think that it's hard to look at a lot of faces 
if you have any kind of impairment to neurological stuff. So I would try to have, you know, fewer faces to look at because I think that matters. I'm trying to think there's something else I'm forgetting. Oh, I would have six classes instead of eight. So people living with Parkinson's didn't have to feel like they had to stay for eight classes. But wow. That's how the class went. It, it's been fun. And I, I've done it. I also have offered it. I was surprised at this, but I told you I work in a cancer clinic and some of the teachers there asked what I teach it there, not for cancer, but for people with any illness. And I said, well, I'd be happy to, but I don't know how it'll be for the care. This was the caregivers class. I don't know how it will be for the caregivers of people living with Parkinson's, how they feel about being in a class with people living with cancer. It's different, right? Might be different kind of stuff that they're dealing with than what you're dealing with. And I still don't have an answer to that. So I always ask people that are taking it. I, I let them know up front, this is what this particular class is. Do you want to be in this one or you want to wait till I'm doing one just for people living with Parkinson's? I, it's, it's fine with me. I, I just want people to know that, you know, they may be talking with people that are having a very different kind of experience. I think the skills that I teach, we could teach, we should be teaching these things in kindergarten to everybody. We all need these skills. This is not, something that's only for people with serious illness. I just think when you have serious illness, then you really need them. But I'd rather have people know these things, you know, from the get go. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think in the COVID time frame, I think we're all realizing that we need some of these skills, you know, just on a day to day basis. Um, yeah. you know, with the uncertainty and many of the uh, things that are happening in this world. So I think we, if we could clone you, Judy, and put you out there all over the place, make hundreds and thousands of you maybe, well, we could, but I think, you know, you'll be very busy after this session for sure. I'm sure there'll be a bunch of people who want to, you know, um, partake in your, your sessions. And I think, you know, you had mentioned possibly learning, um, moving into a direction of training other trainers um, that can facilitate this, which I think is the next step. And I think, you know, possibly partnering with an organization like this one or others that um, can really outreach to those, all those places where we may not have these sorts of services and you know a lot of what we've talked about on this series is that in many parts of the country um, many parts of the world there is not even a neurologist trained in parkinson's let alone this amazing team that you guys have in san francisco there may not be a palliative care doctor um, you know to serve hundreds and hundreds of miles in some of uh, the us and so we really need to be able to use modalities and you know kudos to you for you know, reinventing this in a way that can really access the people because the people that I worry about the most are the people that are the most isolated in their homes, often, you know, um, not being able to access other people, possibly in rural communities or just, you know, with um, sick to love, sick loved ones at home. And now with COVID, it's, it's sort of put this all, you know, even in, in a more distressing situation. So I think we just really have to think outside the box. Um, so I think, you know, from a practical standpoint, uh, Judy, what are maybe the top five tips that you have for caregivers that might be struggling right now? That might be, <laughs> might be, you know, the sort of, uh, I'm Canadian, so they call them the Coles notes, but I, I think here there, there's some other, you know, like the sort of the, the, the notes that you cheat on those. Uh, if you don't want to read the book, you, you get the, I don't know what the notes are here called. But. Notes. We call them Cliff notes. <laughs> notes. There you go. <laughs> the, the, what's that? If you, can, if you can maybe come up with five practical tips just to give people a teaser. And, and I think the eight week class is not to be missed. Um, you know, I think that that is a must do for everyone as well, but maybe you could give us just five five practical tips maybe that your top sort of things and it, it may not be it might be things that you've learned and that that really you know you've sort of amassed over this experience or it might be other things that are a little bit more you know sort of obvious what, what I'll leave it to you thank you well I would start with and uh, it's just this is just in my awareness right now because someone just asked me I would say so important to be connected with a movement disorder specialist if, if someone's not and so important to be connected with palliative care which is something you can request. It doesn't have to be someone else referring you. You can make that request. And, you know, maybe a stretch. It may be hard. They may be far away or not. I don't know. But I, I would wish for that for people. Um, tips. You know, I taught you that grounding thing. Uh, when I'm teaching the class, I usually tell people, the very first time I meet them, I say, really, if you only learn one thing, for me, this is really all that matters. Here's what it is. If you notice what's happening, if you notice, if you notice it, that's a big thing. If you notice what's going on, then you can make a skillful, hopefully skillful choice about how you respond. 
Now that may sound simple, but, but my, in my experience, let's say if I'm experiencing a strong emotion, let's say if I'm angry, then I'm really busy being angry. And sometimes I like to use my, my older brother, David, whom I love dearly, but you know, naturally he's my older brother. Sometimes I get annoyed with him. But let's pretend I'm, I'm annoyed with my brother, David, right now. I'm going to be really busy being annoyed with David. And that's the only thing I'm noticing. I'm not noticing I'm stressed. I'm not noticing I'm angry. I'm not noticing if my heart's beating faster. All I'm doing is being busy being angry and thinking he's a jerk and thinking I better tell him he's a jerk. You know, because I'm his kid's sister. That's what I'm supposed to do, right? So I may choose not to. Anyway, the, I'm making a, um, a kind of irreverent, silly story of this. But what I really am saying is that if I notice, right, and humans can do this, if I notice that I'm annoyed right now, even while I'm still annoyed, then all of a sudden I've got just like a little hairbreadth of space. I go, oh, that's what's happening. I'm being angry with my older brother again. That's what's going on right now. Doesn't mean I'm not still annoyed. He may have said something that was annoying. That's fine. But I can notice what's happening. And if I notice, then I have lots of choices. One of them might be, oh, I can zip up my lip and not tell him he's a jerk right now. That's one thing I could do right now. Maybe, um, maybe I just need to take a deep breath and ground myself. And realize it's not about me. This is just our history. We need to stop doing this. But I've noticed, right? When I notice, I have a choice. And there are a million things we can get stressed about, resentful about, upset about. If I notice what's happening, I can choose. And the faster I notice, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm going to clear my throat. Yeah. I would say not only is noticing important, but the faster we notice, the better. Because if we don't notice for a while, that's okay. But then the longer we wait, if it's a strong emotion, the more likely it is that we're going to be flooded with adrenaline and cortisol. And we're going to have to be patient and give it time to go away again, right? To dissipate. If we notice sooner, we can interrupt the stress hormones sooner. So the sooner we notice, the better, right? So that's useful as well. I'd say that's a great tip. And then there are lots of ways of being, um, because it's a tip and not a long, a long lesson of any kind, I would say what I find super important is to be able to know some more things about how to be with difficult emotions, how to meet them. And there are skills, simple skills any one of us can learn to do that. You know, I would say simple practices are good. And if we have time, I'll show you one that's a simple gratitude practice. I mean, we're all thankful for a million things all the time, but there's a way of doing a gratitude practice that is actually beneficial to the brain. So I thought I would, um, I'll show it to you like it as a really quick practice at the sure. end. Be a tip. Yeah, we have about 12 minutes. So I was also gonna ask you, so I'd love to get um, a sense of your gratitude practice. And I know you're also, um, quite interested in journaling too. So maybe before we go to the gratitude practice, you can just speak a little bit about that because I know you have created your own journal and Dr. Uh -huh. is a big fan of it as well. So <laughs> just speak about so, maybe give give the, the folks um, on the call a little maybe, you know, idea or two for journaling and then and then we can close, you know, with the, the gratitude practice maybe. Uh, and yeah. So the journaling, I, I would say, um, I'm going to not call it journaling for a reason, because a lot of people think when I'm saying journaling, I'm referring to writing paragraphs about stuff that is on your mind and on your heart, which I think can be a wonderful practice, but that's not what Dr. Katz was referring to. She was referring to a journal that I use in my classes, and it came up because I was teaching some clinicians some things about what they might do to help themselves out if they were feeling stressed. And, and they, they, of course, were looking at me like, I don't have time to do anything or write it down. And I said, fine, here's a little notebook. And I gave them a little notebook about this size. And I said, here, I want you to write these three things down. So that's where it started. And one of our study coordinators said, Judy, I can make it look nicer. So she put a pretty cover on the front and she wrote some instructions on the first page. So the journal includes three things. It's a place for people to write down um, a daily intention, which is one we did not go over today, but it was a practice. A second one was to come up with a goal with four goals for the week. And I will out myself and say, I don't, I don't like goals because they make me crazy. But these goals are like, 
looking at our lives through four lenses that are physical, social, mental, and spiritual, and seeing if we can think of one thing for each one of those categories that we could stand to do that we like, that we think is fun, that we might do next week. And when they write it in their journal, I always say, you have to write down where you're going to do it and at what time and with who. You have to be real specific because otherwise it'll never happen. So even if it's me saying I'm going to take a walk, I need to say Tuesday at three in the afternoon from my front door up to Noriega Street and back. It's got to be that specific in order to make it happen. So I ask people to write down one of those in each category. And then the gratitude practice is one that's interestingly been studied a lot by social psychologists, has been found to have a lot of benefits. And if it's okay with you, I'm going to go into that now and explain how that one works. So um, this is a little beyond the usual. And some of you may have done this already, don't know, because it's become fairly popular, thankfully. But this is found to be beneficial physiologically as well as emotionally. And it's a practice that is in contrast to what our mind normally does. So our minds are wired to notice when something's dangerous. And that's a good thing, right? That's to help us take care of ourselves. I should notice when there's a threat so I can get away from the threat or do something that will neutralize the threat. And that's a lot of what our, our human experience is about. May I, can I notice threats and keep myself safe? That's good. But that means I'm always looking for threats on some level. Now, I, I, I understand some people are hypervigilant because they've had difficult things in their past, but even in normal everyday life, all of us kind of notice, is there anything dangerous here? That's what we scan for. The gratitude practice teaches our brains to also scan for positive things. And I won't try to go into all the benefits of positive psychology, because I'm going to guess a lot of you probably are, are aware of that from general magazine articles, books, news articles about positive psychology. Gratitude practice trains the brain to also look for positive things without even trying. You don't even have to try to do it. You just do the gratitude practice and it happens. And it works like this. At night, sometime at night, roughly before you go to sleep, you write down, you think back about your day, today. In broad brush strokes, they always say, don't go into too much detail or you'll never get to sleep. So you think about your day in broad brush strokes and you see if you can come up with three things that you're grateful for. And it could be anything. It could be the feel of the hot water on my shower in the morning. It could be the sunlight coming through the kitchen window when I was having my lunch. It could be, um, it could be one of your kids, it could, you could say my daughter, but it should be very specific for today. When my daughter called me up today and told me about her, whatever, but it should be extremely specific for today, not general. So you think of three things, three specific things, then if it's comfortable for you to do this, you write them down. For some reason, they say that that makes it get through to the brain better when you actually physically write it down. And you don't need to write a paragraph about each one. It can be two words, sunlight, lunchtime, you know, sunlight through kitchen window at lunchtime. I was teaching this to one young man, a cancer patient online, and I saw him thinking about it. He wanted to learn this and he was thinking about it. And I saw him doing this, if you can see my hand right now. I said, Stuart, what are you doing? And he said, I'm remembering petting the cat. He was running his hand up the cat's tail. That was his memory. So it can be anything, but it should be something that's very specific that you remember today. And you write it down. And after you've written down one, two, three, here's what you do with it. You don't do anything with it. You put it down, you go to sleep, and you never have to look at it again. You may if you want to, but you don't have to. All that you do is that. And then you make some sort of a, a commitment that you'll do it for two weeks. And then at the end of two weeks, just stop and reflect. How was it to do that? Am I starting to notice during the day things that I'm thankful for? without even trying. You're not trying to do it, but the brain begins to notice. So very interestingly, this is a very old saying in the Buddhist tradition, but the neuroscientists are all over this now. They say, where we direct our attention becomes the inclination of our minds. Isn't that a good one? Where we direct our attention becomes the inclination of our minds. So by doing this practice, our minds begin to incline towards noticing things that we're grateful for. 
and um, there's um, there's a center in California at Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. It's called the Greater Good Science Center, and they talk a lot about the benefits of a lot of the social psychology practices that we've learned about now. And they have a wonderful gratitude poster that tells why it's helpful to do this practice emotionally, why it's helpful socially, and why it's helpful physiologically. So I'll send that to you. If I may, Dr. Subramanian, maybe you can make that available to people. They might enjoy that. So it's a, it's a wonderful practice. And what I love about it is there's no need to think about it during the day. You don't need to try to think, oh, I better think of my three things. You don't need to do that. You just go through your day like you normally would. But your brain knows that at night you're going to go through this again. So it just begins to notice things. It just begins to do that. And if not, you'll remember your day and you'll think about it and you'll come up with them. Sounds amazing. No, I love that. I think gratitude is so powerful. And I've you know done some, some of the courses at the Greater Good. And I, I think they're amazing. And they have a happiness course as well. And all okay. kinds of things that are out there. There's plenty of things out there on online and we'd love to get any of the resources that you have, Judy. And I'm grateful for you and your existence in our universe of um, mm -hmm. being able to call on you and understand more about how to help our patients and our caregivers. Um, we have about four minutes left. I might just let you give us either verbally, you know, um, some inspiration and some, you know, um, sort of uh, hope and joy and tips for you know that sort of looking looking positively to the future or if you want to close with a, a meditation that's fine too i'll leave it to you oh, wonderful choices well i will i will say one practice that i think is super easy and wonderful and i'll, I'll suggest this one to you and then we'll close with just a, another um you can call it a meditation, but it'll be sort of another breath to kind of quiet the space a little bit. So the practice is the one, the other one that's in the journal that we were talking about a few moments ago, or I was talking about, and it's um, intention setting. I think that's such a powerful practice. Whoever thinks of that, what, I was supposed to set an intention today? Why was I supposed to do that? I never thought of it. And yet it's so useful. And the way, there are many ways to practice it, but one of the very simple ones that I love is actually thinking, is there some word, is there some value that's important to me that I'd like to just remember or maybe bring into my life a little bit more? So on that note, I'm gonna ask each of you to see if you can think of something. I'll give you some suggestions and you can think of other ones later, but to see if you can think of one right now. It could be something like, when I say values, I'm thinking of words like kindness, something you would want to offer the world. Okay? It could be love. It could be patience. It could be, I had one physician say this, I want to be more non-judgmental. So his word was non-judgmentalism. You know, whatever your intention is for the day, it could be um, courage, it could be integrity. I mean, think of some word that, that, that's meaningful for you. And the way the intention practice works is that you think of that in the morning. So you get, you're getting up in the morning, whatever your normal morning practice is, you're rolling out of bed, um, you haven't rolled out of bed yet. How, whenever you want to do it, you think, what's my intention today? And you go, oh yeah, it's going to be kindness. Or pa Let's make patience. That's a tough one. So I was like, patience. I want to be more patient today. And then what you do with it during the day is this. You don't do anything with it unless you're in an interaction with someone, you're talking with someone that might be a little bit stressful. Remember, we're back to A. Can I notice? Can I notice when something's stressful? So you notice it. Then you remember your word. You go, oh, patience. You don't need to say it out loud. You don't need to tell anyone else. You just recall what your word is, patience. And see if just by remembering, if that shifts or changes anything for you in how you relate to the person that you're talking with. Maybe it doesn't change anything, or maybe it just changes your body language. Maybe it changes what you choose to say next. Don't know, but it's a great practice. It helps you to kind of really remember, oh yeah, I really wanted to see if I could be more patient today. So I would offer that to you as something you could try out. You know. And um, by way of closing in one moment, I think we'll go back to the grounding so we can just practice it because it's such a great practice. So on the next in-breath, would you breathe in and notice the sensation of the air entering your nostrils? Go. 
During the out-breath, drop into your body. Notice the sensation of the support of the chair beneath your sit bones. We'll do it one more time. Whoops, it's one o'clock. We're top of the hour. Okay, you can do it a couple more times. It's fine. <laughs> okay, so we'll do it a couple more just for the fun of the practice. So breathe in. Notice the sensation of the air entering your nostrils. During the out breath, drop into your body. Notice the sensation of the support of the chair. And a third and last time. Breathe in. Notice the sensation of the air entering your nostrils. Breathe out. Drop into your body. Notice the sensation of the support of the chair. So thank you so much for allowing me to be in your living rooms, wherever you are this right now. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I'm really happy to have been here today. Thank you so much for inviting me, Dr. Subramanian. It's been a pleasure. It's our pleasure. Thank you so much, Judy. Thank you for all the work that you do. It's so important. I'm glad you found this career path and in your meandering and <laughs> have brought it to us here today and that we could use this um, virtual way to connect with you and your great work. So hopefully we will be able to offer this to more to all of the patients in, in the world and, and in the universe because these are such important teachings and I think you have a wealth of experience. So, so we hope that we can bring more of this uh, to, to you all out there as well. So um, I will pass it back to you, Rebecca, um, with PMD Alliance for our final wave. And uh, thank you again, Judy, for making the time. Yes, thank you so much, Judy. Thank you, Dr. Subramanian. I don't know about the rest of you, but this was wonderful, probably one of my favorite ones that we've done so far. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we do have another program on Friday, same time, noon Pacific time. Hope you'll join us. Um, and just so you know, there were a lot of good resources and links that were posted in the chat. So before I log off um, or end the chat or end the program, I will give you the op option to download that chat. And it's, if you open the chat, there's like three little dots um, in the lower right hand corner. If you click on that, um, you can click save chat and you can have those resources to your computer. Um, but we are gonna end with our wave. So thank you all so much. If you have your cameras to turn on and we will see you on Friday. Thank you. Bye.